What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first regular episode of the year. Man, when we said at the end of last year we were going to have some guests, we kind of meant it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 <laughs> we, we haven't done nothing but, but guests uh, since the middle of December, um, which I have been having a blast. I hope everybody else has been having a blast. Thanks so much to everybody that's come on so far. And what's what's really great is the folks that have been on are asking to come back. Right. So, you know, that's... That's that's awesome. We we really have a good time chatting with people about scary movies and conventions and all that fun stuff. So, hope you've been enjoying the kind of uh, revamped Undead Scary Dad podcast. And now it's time for a regular episode. It is uh, January thirteenth, twenty twenty one, and it is episode one hundred sixty six of the Scary Dad podcast, where um, we. If you haven't noticed, if you haven't joined us on our Facebook uh, group, Scary Dad's Haunted Forum, you need to. Because if you like the show, um, it's like ten times the show. Where everybody's <laughs> just talking about sc- cool, scary stuff, sharing clips and videos, sharing memes. This is fun. It's answering polls, fun you know, all kinds of cool, neat stuff that um, that we're doing. So, Not to mention the giveaways for every 50 people that we get to follow the page, which is yep. always a plus for being a member. And I just got an order in of some really cool stuff from Evil Jays, who's one of those people I'm going to reach out to and see if we can't have him on the show um, sometime in the very near future. But yeah, I've got some cool giveaways, these really kick-ass uh, skull keychains and different, like, uh, uh, just weird colors. They're like they're they're, cool. they're 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 really kick ass. My favorite one is the pink one. Like I don't want to give away my pink ones, <laughs> dude. I really I mean like, you remember the eighties when people had freestyle bikes, the, yeah, the, the yeah. GT bikes, and they were in the either the the like super Deglo pink or lime mm-hmm. green or whatever. Like that's kind of coming back, and I'm noticing like how awesome that color is. So um, I'm keeping the pink ones, but I'll give away the others because I ordered them for giveaways. I just didn't realize how cool they were gonna be. But, um, yeah, so what we did on the forum was we didn't ask us anything. We said we would touch base with a couple of questions if you had them. So um, if we took too many questions, we'd have a show that was too long, so we just took a few. But um, also the answers to a couple of the questions made us realize we needed to revisit some subjects that uh, we probably haven't talked about in a while. So uh, without – Further ado, we're going to invite our friend, Mr. Gomez. First, the old business. All right. So we're back to this day in horror in uh, history. And one of the voices of horror history that sends a chill down the spine of just about anybody that hears him is uh, Mr. Robert Stack was yes. born on this date in uh, 1919. Um, I didn't realize he was that old wow. whenever, whenever he passed. James, wow. He's been around for a long time, <laughs> but, um, everybody, I mean, Unsolved Mysteries is one of the longest running shows. We actually did an episode on it. Um, an entire, I think we did a two part episode on yeah. Unsolved Mysteries. Cause it was a big part of our childhood. Cause man. yeah, I mean, even you just hear it come on from a other room and get a chill down your spine knowing like, it's kind of like knowing sharks are in the water. There's people out there. Right. And, and these these stories are unsolved. Well, you know, my son, he, uh, whenever I was trying to explain to him what Unsolved Mysteries was, he told me, he says, well, you know, that's kind of what Forensic Files is, is, is to me now. Because Forensic Files, what it's been on for 10 years, has had the same narrator the entire time. So he can relate to hearing that voice and just associating that voice with just something really, really creepy. Because Forensic Files, while everything was solved, it, it got he got kind of creepy for a young child. Yeah. Right? He definitely remembers that. But yeah, he uh, he can relate to it. But yeah, Unsolved Mysteries. And what I love is the Netflix Unsolved Mysteries series. What I love about that show is they did not try to replace Robert Stack as the narrator. Right. That made it so much better than it could have been. Because I have a feeling they would have tried to find somebody to replace his narration. It just it would have fell flat and it would have been annoying. 
but luckily they decided to just stay away from that altogether. So then next we have on this date in 1938, William B. Davis, who's not known for much, but he is an iconic character that is unforgivable, unforgivable, well, unforgivable and unforgettable, <laughs> but he is the cigarette smoking man from the X-Files. Okay. Um, one thing about it is, again, he didn't he didn't say much and he didn't do much, but you knew that when he was on screen that there was danger. Right. You know, like awesome character. Um. Now this dude did some horror, but you know you know him more for uh, comedy. But uh, this date in 1943, Mr. Richard Mull from mm -hmm. uh, Night Court. Yeah. Um, and he played some crazy characters and some bad guys and stuff here and there. But um, but yeah. He did have a full head of hair one time. <laughs> I have seen it. Well, his head was shaved because, I mean, if yeah, you see him even, yeah. even older, he's got, like, a, a power donut. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, going back, sorry, the Unsolved, Unsolved Mysteries episode I meant to, to mention, if you want to listen to that, that starts at episode 56. Um, we are now recording episode 166, so it's been a couple of years. Um, but that was a really fun episode. Yeah. Um, all right. So now in this Dayton horror history, just count, counting, counting forward from, from the oldest to the newest, um, on this date in 1939, they released son of Frankenstein in 1973. And I've never seen this, but I just like the way they titled movies back in the day. Cause there was just like, there was, there's no subtlety. This is the Satanic Rites of Dracula, 1973. <laughs> like those Hammer horror movies, are like like pretty much give away the whole movie with um, <laughs> plot. Like, like this is this is what it is. <laughs> um, I've never seen this movie. Maybe you have, but I remember the the cover looking awesome. But uh, Deep Star Six. I remember that movie too. But I'm not sure if I've ever that's seen the cover it. that has like the diving. Uh, guy it's like his, his it's got a helmet and a torso yeah. and like the arms are ripped off yes yeah i remember that but i don't, I don't think i've ever seen that i don't i don't think i have well i know i haven't but i remember seeing the video mm -hmm. and then choosing to watch something else <laughs> um something that's near and dear to our hearts but in 1989 if you were in 1989 right now you'd be lining up to go see pumpkin head i love 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 pumpkin head, dude man. pumpkin head is one of those that uh I remember when it first came out and the, just the, the monster itself without knowing the story, without seeing the movie, but just seeing the monster, I just knew that this movie is going to be awesome. Cause look at that guy. Well, what's cool about the movie is, <laughs> and I remember this very, very well. Is that I used to subscribe to Fangoria when I was young. Uh, and I remember, I remember the Fangoria issue where they talked about Stan Winston put together Pumpkinhead and they created this monster. They didn't have a movie for it yet. So they were like, we've got to put this in something. And the next thing you know, they came out with Pumpkinhead to fit the monster, which is, a, I, I, I love that. Yeah, and Stan yeah. Winston directed it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Lance Henriksen, I mean, it's been a great, great film. And it's it's such the perfect revenge movie, too. Because those kids, I mean, Pumpkinhead can't, he's, he's worse than Jason. Yeah. Because <laughs> at least Jason, at some point, can get stopped. Pumpkinhead just won't. Right. And, and not only won't, he, he can't. Mm -hmm. Like he's just, that's the curse is he won't stop until he's you, finished. until he's done. And, uh, all right. So probably not as highbrow as pumpkin head, but in 1989, also we had stripped to kill two subtitled live girls. <laughs> that's not the first one. I've never seen the second. <laughs> um, 1995, our friend Billy Zane in demon night. Nice. In 2002, this was less horror and more kind of just dread, but uh, Robin Williams' movie, One Hour Photo. I remember that. Got, it's it's, it's a great movie where he gets obsessed yeah. with the family through their uh, through their pictures and right. stuff. Creepy. Robin Williams, like a lot of comedic actors, they just know that that spot to hit. Well, you can say the same with John Lithgow. Mm -hmm. John Lithgow knows how to be a funny guy, but he can also be a creepy psychopath when he wants to. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> So um, that's what I got right now for old business. We will take a break and come back with the new. Mystic places, psychic phenomena, unnatural experiences, 
all sources of fascination and speculation. Now read Mystic Places, the book that helps unlock the secrets of the ages. What are the signs of a lost land reappearing? Was this an ancient spaceship runway used by aliens? Read Mystic Places, free for 10 days. Keep it for $12.99. Other volumes will follow from Mysteries of the Unknown, the Time Life series that sold over 2 million books. All right, here we are. Uh, what's, what's crazy is just, you know, I have, I have news aggregate websites that I use for new business that I go through. And unfortunately, because of the times we're in right now, there isn't much other than politics and coronavirus. It is few and far between. <laughs> so we don't have a whole lot of new business today, but we got a few things that we have to really talk about. So Mr. Gomez. Okay, now this isn't horror, but her death definitely hit because when you think of 80s, there's not an 80s kid that doesn't know Police Academy. And uh, Marion Ramsey, who played Officer Hooks, the uh, the very soft-spoken <laughs> female she officer was of Police awesome. Academy. Oh, yeah. Uh, she passed away at the age of 73. Of course, she's best known for appearing as Officer Hooks in the Police Academy movies, and she was in all of them, if I'm not mistaken. And they ended up having like six or something. Uh, she was born in 1947. She started acting on stage in the original Broadway run of Hello, Dolly, and later ended up moving into movies where she ended up getting her iconic role in the Police Academy series as Cadet Laverne Hooks. And she definitely, she she was still scenes. She was, uh, that character was just great to the movie. And apparently, eventually, she reprised her uh, her role for a episode of Robot Chicken when they were making fun of, uh, of the show. So, R.I.P. Tanya Officer Roberts. Hooks. That was some crazy stuff. With, wasn't it? I mean, it it's so sad because I totally understand what happened, but it was just bizarre yeah. in that, like, uh. And I know a lot of people are talking about her being a Bond girl and her being on Charlie's Angels, but for me, you and I both know how much Beastmaster means to us. You know, from being in, in just Carrie in that movie, she was. She was absolutely beautiful. Her eyes were just mesmerizing. She, mm -hmm. had, she was perfect in that role. And as again, we, we've talked about Beastmaster not as an as a subject of the show, but I mean, for as cheesy and campy and like honestly, I read people like they always preface Beastmaster with some kind of pejorative, like essentially the sucky movie Beastmaster. I'm sorry, dude. Beastmaster is an awesome movie. <laughs> yes. um, it's it's got elements of horror. It's got adventure. It's got sci-fi. It's got romance. It's got ferrets. I mean, it's it's a good movie. Mm -hmm. and, and and yeah, is it is it Conan? No, but Conan was its own thing, right? So I. I can't I can't follow along when people are like, oh, you know, it's this guilty pleasure. No, it's 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 a good, it's a, it's a good it's, it was it, awesome. There's so many scenes in that movie that as a kid just stick in your head so hard. Whenever the witch removes the baby from the woman's belly and you can see the cow's belly growing with it, mm -hmm. it's a creepy ass scene. Whenever Rip Torn is throwing the child in the fire. Shit like that, dude. There was a, the, the ring with the eye in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the kid's stab starts bleeding all over the kid's head. When you're a kid seeing that shit, it's a, it's a bit scary. The bird people that like suck the yeah. meat <laughs> off the bones. Like, well. I mean, there's, yeah, there, I will, I will go to my grave defending Beastmaster against anybody that wants to say it's campy or stupid. It's good. It's a good movie. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So RP. Tanya Roberts. Sure. Yeah, one of my first crushes, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, you may have heard that they are going to be making a sequel to The Exorcist coming from Blue House Films. And it's been announced that it's going to be directed by David Gordon Green. You may know David Gordon Green from 2018's Halloween. And he's also going to be directing Halloween Kills also. But uh, yeah, he'll be revising The Exorcist franchise, which being that the 2018 Halloween, which I was kind of concerned about it sucking, it ended up not uh, I have no problem with this at this point. So I think you're yeah, doing, Blue Miles will do a good job. With it. Yeah, 2018. The, the the thing is, and and we'll talk about it on an episode with Boom because he wanted to talk about some remakes. But you know, it's like 
it, when you go to franchise films, you know, we talk about Fridays all the time, but you talk about a nightmare or a Halloween. It's like, it didn't used to matter. Like you didn't have to have all of this perfect continuity. You didn't have to have like, you could t say pretty much any one of the Halloween movies after Halloween two is a reboot because it does not make any sense in any kind of continuity timeline. Right. Right. Some of them are better than others and all of them kind of suck except for the first two, but they're fun. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not horrible movies. Um, but the whole thing, like Halloween 2018, they're like, oh, well, you had this and you had that and it didn't break new ground. Dude, here's what you, what, you, what you had in a Halloween movie. You had Michael Myers being a scary-ass mofo, walking around killing people without saying anything and being relentless. Right. And it was good. I enjoyed it. And if you didn't, then fine, but shut up. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I was never a fan of The Exorcist, but I'm willing to give it a chance with uh, – because that dude knows how to scare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, he does. Uh, okay. Another story. I'm sure most people have seen this already. But I, like I said, I had to kind of reach back to find some new business for today. But uh, scientists have come out after getting some, uh, some footage from under the sea. Okay. Sometimes octopuses are really assholes. <laughs> and they'll just randomly punch fish just because they're pissed off. Have you seen that video? <laughs> I haven't seen them punch them. Dude, you gotta see this video where this fish is basically just hanging out and this octopus purposely runs over and he has his tentacle rolled up and he unrolls it like one of those party favors. <laughs> and he just punches the shit out of the fish and the fish takes off. It's the funniest thing. <laughs> Dude, you gotta try to think it up. Okay, uh, so I just say sometimes octopuses and fish love to pursue, pursue prey, but they may not always get along. <laughs> it seems octopuses can get a little salty and randomly punch their hunting partner sometimes out of spite. It, it's just, it's awesome. The bullet's behavior was caught on camera by researchers observing interaction between octopuses and several fishes, uh, fish species in the Red Sea. Uh, Footage was captured by a researcher from the University of Portugal to show several octopuses lashing out at fish as they happily swim. This one belongs to This is chilling. An octopus just decides to Yeah, if you get a chance, check out the video, man. It's, uh, it's good stuff. And finally, just in our stupid uh, criminal segment of the week. All right. January 4th, police found a scale in bags containing white and brown substances in a Florida man's backpack. The man said he was carrying a bag of sugar and a bag of cornstarch to bake a cake. <laughs> and it just happened at 3 o'clock in the morning on New Year's Eve. The funny thing about this story is the guy's name is Jethro Genius. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't too much of a genius. Uh, after they searched his back backpack, he admitted that it was his. Two large bags of white and brown substance. He uh, he said, "Yeah, I want a backpack, but I'm just gonna bake a cake." <laughs> <laughs> it ended up being uh, two thirds of a pound of ecstasy that he had with him. Wow. Arrested and locked up in a uh, forty-seven thousand dollar bond. Uh, he's been arrested in the past for a ton of shit, man: burglary, marijuana possession, providing false information to the cops, resisting arrest. Position of paraphernalia, so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't much of a genius. To say the least. <laughs> and there was also a guy, I didn't bring this up, but there's a guy busted in a uh, selling meth. And <laughs> cops got a tip that somebody was selling meth out of a storage unit somewhere. So they go over to the storage unit, which I found funny in the article is they had been to the storage unit before. Because somebody had died of a drug overdose at the storage unit, <laughs> but they never investigated the storage unit, which just surprises the shit out of me. So they get in there, it looked like this guy was actually living in the storage unit, and they found a shitload of meth and baggage and everything. And his his defense was, I don't sell it. My friends come over, they know I have meth, and I give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> so he couldn't understand why he was getting arrested for uh, they just so know it. They just he know was it. just giving it away. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that's what I got this week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break and we will be back. The shape. The face. The town. The night. 
ten years later. He's back. Halloween 4, the return of Michael Myers. Rated R. Starts party, the theater or driving near you. All right, we are back. Here we are. All right, so, like I said, we've done quite a few recap episodes here and there, but we've never really done a whole lot of, like, follow back around to old subjects, which is odd for a podcast, because a lot of times they talk about, we talk about the same stuff a lot, but we don't ever revisit the same old subjects. We're trying not to. But it's um, coming around that maybe we should, because we've got a lot of content back out there and we've come along quite far in our both our podcasting abilities and our education on different stuff and right. perspectives and movies we didn't see back then that we have seen since or right. there was a couple of things just over the past couple of weeks uh, while watching stuff at home that i definitely want to revisit again because it's been a while and it was a serial killer marathon that was on like 35 different serial killers they talked about <laughs> and uh I watched a, a documentary called The Women's, Women of Jonestown, and you know how Jonestown has always been fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. That's definitely one that I'd like to read again. Yeah. But, um, so we put it out to the, uh, to the forum, and we've had a couple questions. You know, I got a couple of text messages and people answering the, the thing. But um, one of the ones from Allison was asking if we'd done anything or we wanted to talk about some haunted places. And I think that was inspired by, I posted the uh, Stanley hotel that I visited. Yeah. So if you are not on the forum and you don't, you're not familiar with the story back in February of 2020, before everything went crazy, I got to go to the Stanley hotel up in Colorado and the Stanley hotel is where Stephen King stayed, where he was inspired to write the shining. And so, of course, they have the Haunted Hotel tour, and outside of Stephen King and that whole mythos, the hotel's uh, history and everything is very cool, and it was haunted before Stephen King ever showed up. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's, uh, it's a legacy sort of place, and uh, so I got a whole bunch of pictures, and I posted it, and Scott and I did an episode. Um, I would reference it if I knew, but I just remembered. We did a horror bucket list a while yeah. back and so like well, a couple of mine was to swim with great white sharks and go visit the stanley hotel and well i got to scratch that one off and you know there's some other haunted places that i'd like to see so allison asked you know what are some haunted places and you know places you've seen or whatever and um the reality is with covid and shutting everything down like the galveston uh lantern tours got shut down right. and the houston goes you know, ghost tours and stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I'd like to do and I'd like to collaborate with and maybe do some like video stuff. But, um, my next big thing is I, I bought this book. It was actually kind of funny. Um, got this book about Galveston because I was trying to do a little bit of research to help my friend Craig, who's building Tell terror Isle, which is a haunted attraction down in Texas city. So I bought a book about Galveston, the Gulf Coast, and kind of the history of the pirates and, the monk, you know, all of that stuff. And I was reading it, and there's a lot of really neat stuff hidden, like, right straight in plain sight. Yeah. And Galveston has uh, essentially been destroyed, like, three times. Yeah. And, like, the body count in Galveston is it's high. is very high. And everything there is that that's still standing is is very haunted. And even further down the beach, like further down outside of Galveston, but further down south on the coast, um, there's there was a city called Indianola in the same 1900 hurricane that wiped Galveston almost off the map. It wiped Indianola completely off the map. And there's like foundations and stuff you can go explore from mm -hmm. these places that the, the, that place never came back. It never recovered. So there's some places that I'd like to go just on you know, a weekend away that's just kind of down south and it's been there my whole life. And you talk about going and exploring haunted New Orleans. Well, that's cool. Except for that six hours away. Galveston right. is like an hour and a half. Right. Um, so that's kind of my next sort of thing. My wife and I are talking about trying to do a weekend jaunt down to Galveston and go look at kind of what's haunted. Hmm. How about yourself? Well, definitely. Uh, you might remember me and Olivia, my daughter, were planning on going to a uh, 
to the Stanley last year that she was wanting to go to Colorado to visit some friends, and I figured I'd take advantage and go hit the Stanley while they're up there, and that kind of got totally taken away. Uh, but other than that, though, I, my, my kids are starting to show some interest in some of the stories I've told them about back home in Louisiana. So hopefully on the next trip, we'll be able to visit a couple of the plantations out there and some of the other just, you know, we, we've spoken before about the, you know, the land that my mother grew up on. Uh, it used to be part of a tributary coming off of the Bayou Test, which was a major uh, uh, artery of water for pirates back in the day. And it, the legend goes that uh, Jean Lafitte buried some people there. He buried some treasure there, killed a couple of people to bury with them because the way it, it went, pirates would, would kill people and bury them where their treasure was so they'd have ghosts to protect that treasure from people that were trying to find it. And there, there's been some crazy, my, I started telling my kids about those crazy stories back then, and they definitely want to try to visit out that way. Uh, and also, remember we did the episode on haunted sanitariums and prisons? Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, if, you know, once things open back up, that's another bucket list thing. Of all, there's a few of them that have been converted to where you can spend the night in them just to go ahead and experience some of the crazy shit that goes on. I uh, definitely want to get back into that. And that's another one we can revisit, actually, another episode we can revisit. Absolutely. Because the idea of haunted sanitariums, because you know the atrocities that happened in these places way back when. Yeah. Uh, you can only imagine just the demons that exist there. Mm -hmm. Well, even though, even when even when things were benevolent, even thing, when things weren't bad, it was still not a good place to be. Right. You know, the, the, the despair, you know, and not to not to disparage people with mental illness but imagine you have a problem and mm -hmm. there is no kind of solution for it like you know psychology hasn't really been invented yet mm -hmm. and you know drugs haven't been developed yet and if you're just not quite like walking the line normal then you get put in here and even if they're treating you nicely you're locked in a place with, your, with, with yourself, with that yourself, you're battling against for, yeah. for 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 however long. So yeah, pretty pretty frightening. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I'd like to go. If you'd like to go to the asylum, I'd like to go to the beach. So that's <laughs> that's our that's our personality difference there. All right, and so then the next question was cryptids, which we've covered extensively to the point, you know, the the, the subject of cryptozoology and cryptids, it's so vast. Remember, we had to actually categorize <laughs> by the different types. Yeah, and we started way back in episode thirty six when we talked about lake monsters, which in and of itself was one of my more favorite episodes. Because we got to talk about the Loch Ness, we yeah. got to talk about uh, Lake Champlain, um, the Tahoe Tessie, uh, which was, we did a whole episode on sea monsters themselves, so we're only talking about the freshwater lake monsters all around the world. Um, episode 51, we talked about Bigfoot, and um, in episode 86, we talked about Ripley's Believe It or Not, which is also full of that right. kind of stuff. So we've done, we've done a very extensive, but, you know... If you do, if you go to our site and you Google the episode, it'll bring it up. But, you know, if that's something you'd like to hear more and more in depth and detail, I mean, there's an entire podcast dedicated to cryptozoology. So I'm, I'm more than happy to go, uh, talk more about it. <laughs> well, I think I mean, well, it might be a good idea. We could each do our top 10 of all the cryptids. True. Which ones that we just, cause growing up when we did with weekly world news and Ripley's Believe It or Not, we learned a lot about cryptids just as children. Well, and that's what's funny, too, is because, you know, science for all of its wonderful things does really kind of spoil the endings on a lot of stuff. You know, like right. back in the day, you had tabloid magazines and they, they they weren't like the skeptic observer, blah, blah, blah. It was like, you know, the Loch Ness Monster was sighted and you just took it as fact, like, oh, crap. Well, as it, as it was, <laughs> when we were kids, this was something, you know, printed in a paper. That's real. Yeah. That's not a nonfiction book. That's actually news that we're looking at. Yeah. And I was like I said before, I remember about my uh, uh, paternal grandmother. She was a devout follower of Weekly World News. And I used to love going whenever we go visit her house because by the time I got there, she had a new stack. 
And I would just spend the whole weekend just devouring those things. Dude, and we did a whole episode on the Weekly World News, yeah. too. But, dude, remember those ads in the back of Weekly World News that were, like, for life-size and, like, like uh, replica pistols that were yeah. BB guns? Yeah. I wanted, I've wanted those so bad. Like, those look so cool. <laughs> <laughs> like authentic replica, you know, it's like shoots 500 BBs a minute. Like, whoa, that's killer. <laughs> Take yeah, a- we've covered cryptos, but we'll definitely revisit it in some shape or form. Uh, probably not as extensively as we did before, because like we said, that was four episodes. Yeah. It was four hours talking about cryptos. So. <laughs> but yeah, so then next question that came through, and this one's always always hard and so these answers might be different but i just had to go off the top of my head because we just had that interview yesterday with like the stuff that got you into horror like what's your and uh so you know top five what got you into watching horror not so like not your favorite so like one scott's my favorite horror movie is probably the thing right. um or jaws or you know it's like pretty much everybody has the same top few because the cream rises to the top and your standouts are always standouts until they're toppled by something equally outstanding. Right. right? But for me, um, actually this probably does run in order. Um, the thing that got me into horror, um, we'll do, do a top five. So I'll start at five and you start at five and then we'll just go like this. But for me, Piranha, the movie Piranha, I've said it, on this show a dozen times, I've shown on my other show, is filmed was was filmed uh, up north at this resort, this freshwater lake, um, the Aquarina Springs, that was so clear you could see at the bottom, and they had these perch that weren't piranha but looked like them. And we used to go to the resort, and it was an amusement park with the swimming pig and mermaid dance and all kinds of stuff. And they had glass bottom boats, and my I probably was too young or my parents didn't realize I was paying attention, but I saw the movie Piranha or at least parts of it. And then we would go to this place and I'd see those little fish swimming around. And I like, I was scared of them, but I was also just obsessed. I needed to know the rest of the story. I needed to know what's, what's up with this. Right. So um, that for me opened up a whole wide world of cinematic possibilities. <laughs> now uh, that's the Piranha. That's with William Cat. Yeah, the, yeah, the original yeah. one from the yeah. from the seventies, early eighties. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Well, my number five I'll definitely have to go with is just these are movies, the, the way my list kind of goes is it's not in any particular order. But from what I remember as a kid, because technically the first like really wild true horror movie I remember watching was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I only saw it one time when I was young. And I never revisited it again for a, a while. The thing that stuck out with me about Chainsaw is it happened three days after my birthday. You know, it was like August 6th, 1973. I was born August 3rd, 1973. So I always remember that sticking out from the first time I saw that movie. But the stuff that influenced me as a kid the most as far as horror movies go was me and my cousin Mark riding our bikes to the video store, looking for stuff to rent for the weekend and picking stuff out by the covers and there were certain movies where if i couldn't find anything i wanted to rent i would go back to these horror movies i had already seen a million times dude and uh one of them that i'll start off with would definitely be chopping ball chopping ball was awesome Mm -hmm. it was futuristic it was uh you know it was these robots that went on a rampage it was just a a cool ass movie and there was nothing like like there were there was like terminator before the terminator yeah like it's like I said yesterday, it, it, it's the uh, it's where Short Circuit got their story from. <laughs> yeah, Light, lightning strikes the robots, and the robots. Go. And you think you think in terms like back in the day, like mall security. You know, it's like now you've got movies like Paul Blart and Mall Cop. You know, and it's like fat guy on a on a Segway. Right. It's like back then they're like these guys have nuclear reactors on their backs <laughs> because our the stuff that's in a mall is worth defending with with, with, with Death, killer death bots and lasers and stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and exploding heads and all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah, that was a cool. That was definitely one that I remember fondly. I, from the, the that was one movie. of those that I always saw, like on on rotation of cable, mm-hmm. you know. And I was like, it was weird because I never associated the title with the story. Like I didn't want to see Chopping Mall because I thought it was like a slasher, like literally Chopping. Right. 
but I'd watch the robots chase people around the mall and zap them and, you know, shoot at them and stuff. Then whenever I was like, oh, that is that? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Where'd you go on next? So my next one, and this is this is counting backwards to my earliest days, not my favorite, but this, like all of these are the ones that got me in the movies. So the next one's going to be Jaws 3, like I said, um, mm -hmm. on multiple occasions. That was... You know, going all the way back, I was probably like six, seven years old. We just moved to the little town on the beach, you know, like a little seaside town. And um, my parents ordered in cable TV and the guy came in and he installed it. And he put the uh, the uh, TV guide down on the, on the table and it had that picture of the Jaws shark um, rising up above that triangle of water skiers. And... I was always, I was always loved sharks and fish and octopuses, even if they're punching fish, you know, that, that kind of <laughs> yeah, like, dude, I, I was just like, I loved that stuff and seeing the shark, you know, coming up on, on that gaggle of skiers, I had to know what was, I had to know what happened, right? Like I have to, this, this is important, right? And being so young and not really kind of understanding the concept of the real true of between fact and fiction and, and that kind of stuff, I had to see it. Um, I think my parents weren't going to let me see it. And finally, my dad relented and let me see it. And it didn't give me nightmares or anything. I mean, it had a couple of scary parts that like made me shield my eyes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that just woke up a – and, you know, you watch it now and you're just like, oh, really? Come on. You know, like – it doesn't hold up, but man, back then, yeah, that was, that was rough. Right. Dude. And, uh, especially when it like shaved the skin off that dude, like what kind of shark does that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, watching Jaws three, I was like, dude, I'm done. I'm in. And then of course the rest of the Jaws franchise and moving into just regular horror movies. So yeah, that's the one. Cool. The next one I got, and this movie, this was a really, really goofy ass movie, and I remember renting it a million times. It, uh, I remember some of the, this is another one. I remember some of these scenes so vividly. But Blood Diner, the the cover art on the VHS was awesome. I used to rent it all the time. It had boobs in it, which was always a plus with the movie. <laughs> uh, but there's the one scene where. The guy brings the woman to the diner and he's trying to kill her and she won't die, so he shoves her head into the deep fryer. And when she pops out, she's this like huge hush puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and she takes off running and the other brother takes a broom and knocks her in the head and the hush puppy just went flying. And I can remember just me and my cousin Mark just laughing so hard at <laughs> so much stuff in that movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, Blood Diner was a big one for me. And that, that's actually one of my grails for VHS right now. But the price on Blood Diner is ridiculous right now yeah, I imagine so you won't get one for under 100 bucks you know yeah yeah blood diner is a big one but yeah that one i read that movie so many times <laughs> I mean, over and over and over again uh but yeah it, it, that's just one of the movies you know the, the uncle the uncle whose brain was in a jar with two eyeballs and he was still somehow able to talk and you know it was just, as a kid that movie just had everything <laughs> it had the dark humor. It had you know, the nudity. It had everything that I wanted. You make yeah. me want to watch it right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my next one is actually not a movie. It's a it's an anthology short, and um, I had lost this one. Like it was stuck somewhere in my memory for you know. 30 years, 40 years, whatever it was. But I was a little kid. My parents were watching TV. And there was a series on TV. It was a short-lived anthology series. And it was called Catnip. Or not Catnip. It was called uh, uh, Dark Room. And it was in like 1981. So it made me five years old. And they had an episode called Catnip. Where this dude lives next to this lady. And she's a witch. And she's got a cat. And the cat and the lady terrorize this dude until the end. And in the end, like, he looks under the bed. So, like, he accidentally kills the witch. 
And then the cat just starts going ape shit on him. And he's trying to kill the cat. He's like hitting it with a bat and he's like doing all this stuff. And the cat runs under the bed and the dude looks under the bed. And when he looks under the bed, it's the lady's head and it's just like vibrating. And it's just like hissing and like. <laughs> and at five years old, I was just like, I was terrified. Right. It was just, but it was also like, okay, I need more of the story. Like, what? Like, how did? How did? You, like, just move next door to a lady and accuse her of being a witch, and she's like, yes. <laughs> like, oh my god, it's scary as hell, right? So, yes. And I watch it again. It's on YouTube. Yeah, and I remember when you found it. Still as scary as it ever was. <laughs> so, same, same episode has one where a dude like like has some monster in his lake, and he like traps hitchhikers and feeds it to his monster in his lake. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my next one is definitely going to be another one that I've watched a million times. Used to rent it all the time, and. But yeah, next one on my list is definitely. I remember the scene so vividly. It's one of the, another one of the ones that just sticks out in my mind that I saw when I was real young, but I just can never get over the uh, the scene. But Motel Hell, and the scene where he has all these people buried up to their necks, they can't move, and their vocal cords are removed, and they can't talk. That is just one of the creepiest things I had ever seen. <laughs> Motel Hell had, you know, it had comedy, it had elements of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it just had all kind of cool shit in it. And Motel Hell had a great, you know, it had a great poster, it had a great, you know, VHS cover, and that's another one that I rented a lot. It was former <laughs> Vincent. It was former Vincent with his fritters. <laughs> that, that was a good one. That was definitely one that I did like. The next one I'm going to go to, I mean, time-wise, <clears throat> these are probably a tie and these are definitely like very horror ultralight. But what got me into horror was the Disney shorts, like uh, the headless horseman, mm -hmm. the, the haunted house stuff, like the lonesome ghosts, like Disney and the haunted mansion. Like they've always had a really good relationship with uh, spooky, you know, it's yeah. like that gives you that kind of love for what's around the corner and what's the, you know, what's the history and kind of what's, you know, and I think that's for me what draws me into horror. And people are like, oh, "What do you like horror?" It's like, do I really like to see faces get splattered? Like, I have an appreciation for special effects, but I'm not. I'm kind of empathetic. I'm not like real into watching people get hurt. But it's more like, okay, what's the story behind this? Like, what 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 happened? What turned them this way? What you know what I mean? And so like ghosts and monsters and legends and myths and that kind of stuff is what really draws me. And mm -hmm. Disney is really good at that well what they were also really good at as kids and that was probably our first experience with this is the effectiveness of a music score because mm -hmm. those films had always had great scores and they knew how to change mood with the score and you knew when something bad was about to happen you know yeah. they were very fair and that was probably our first you know real experience with that kind of thing. you know and they, they made this stuff like in the 30s 40s 50s and you know and you're watching it in the 70s and early 80s and it's just as effective i mean like there's something primal i think about a haunted house yeah you know just kind of like the dark and shuttered the dilapidated but there's somebody in there and i think still you know that's, that's to me out of all of the scenes in the original <clears throat> Halloween, right? Like, so you've got all the kill sh kill scenes and you've got the jump scares and everything. I think the f most frightening take in that entire movie is uh, when he's looking out the window across the street and he sees Michael carrying the body in the door, right? And he's just a flash because he just looks across the street and he sees the boogeyman carrying the dead girl into the house. Mm -hmm. He looks away for a second. He's gone. Like behind closed doors, all gone now. But then I remember it's probably like the hundredth time I'd seen Halloween. I was at my parents' house for like Thanksgiving and we watched it and I went outside to have a smoke and I started looking at my neighbor's house across the street and I got a shudder. I was like, he could be like, not, not Michael, but a Michael like person. Yeah. Any one of these people could be a serial killer with like, <laughs> with like bodies buried in the backyard. There could be a girl being tortured in any one of these bedrooms right now. And I'm out here having a smoke, and she's looking at me through a crack in the window, right. hoping that I catch a glimpse. But, <laughs> you know, like, that's terrifying. And so, like, and Disney has a really good finger on the pulse of, like, what's behind the curtain? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's to me, what the scary part is. Yeah. Now. So. Yeah, 
definitely see it. But a lot of those old films, even uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, those have hard elements to them. You know, they uh, it's weird how back then they would that was marketed to kids. <laughs> Number four on my list is definitely one that I have seen a million times, including the sequels. Uh, it's one of those ones that I used to go back to often is It's Alive. <laughs> those It's Alive movies with the little demon babies and shit. Uh, <laughs> that was just creepy as hell. And it, like I said, all these movies had all the elements that I enjoy. You know, a little bit of comedy, you know, some terror, gore, special effects. Uh, it's Alive was, was a good one. And, you know, with the creepy babies and everything, you know, eventually I searched out other stuff like Rosemary's Baby and all kind of other shit just to go ahead and, and see what else they had. But definitely It's Alive was one for me. <laughs> That's the one where it's the uh, just like the little pram with the baby in it. And yeah. Like an open doorway off in the distance. Yeah, like, and there's a little hand coming off the side. Yeah. But you don't know what the hell is in the basket. But yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Well, my number one getting me into horror, again, <clears throat> not a movie, but Scooby-Doo, original series. Uh, I don't even remember. Three, four years old, rolling out, you know, waking up from my nap, and Scooby-Doo was on. And I loved it. Like, I was obsessed. Like, So the haunted house, the, 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 the swamp, the monster, the man behind the mask, like, pretty much all horror tropes were encapsulated pretty perfectly inside and of Scooby-Doo. Scooby -Doo. Yeah. And um, I recently, for my daughter, because she got into Scooby-Doo, but the newer series, it's not, it's, it's not good. It's just, it's crap. And so I was like, no, it can't. Like, the, the original Scooby-Doo's weren't crap. And it's not, because I bought her season season one and two on uh, for Christmas. And it's good. Like, oh, yeah. there's, there's story to it, and there's character development, and... There's comedy and there's little spooks. And I always grew up wondering, like, why did they put so many trap doors in their houses? Like, that's, <laughs> there's trap doors in, like, everything, you know? <laughs> like, why would you put that there? It's just like a trap door in the middle of a living room floor. But, you know, like, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah, dude, like, that's that for me is what drew me in. And I think that's, I mean, outside of just about everything else, that was a, that was the very first episode of Scary Dad was me explaining what got me into into horror mm -hmm. because and, and whenever I really tried to trace it down and thought about it that's where it came from was right. was watching Scooby Doo and like you'd see those opening credits with all the different monsters and realize like oh I haven't seen the episode with the uh, diving helmet man and then you see the episode with the diving <laughs> helmet man and you were like ah oh, you know <laughs> so there's there's just a lot in there, a lot to unpack, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's good stuff. So the number one movie that I have to say uh, that I probably rented the most, uh, it, it was just a, a cool-ass movie. Me and my cousin watched this a million times, uh, but starring Kevin Van Hinterick is Basket Case. I can't tell you how many times I watched Basket Case. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times me and my cousin used to reference it in different movies and stuff. When we used to make our stupid little films and everything. But uh, just the the monster in that one, Belial, you know, it was just a cool story. You know, it's a guy who had his deformed Siamese twin removed. And instead of it dying, he stuck it in a basket and got feeding it and shit. Uh, basket Case was just an awesome movie, man. That's when uh, I actually, one of my, hopefully I'll be getting it soon, but one of my uh, kind of grill collectibles I want to get is Tom over at DWM Productions makes a prop, a movie size prop of Belial. And I, I want to get that, set it up in a basket. Just to, uh, <laughs> like that, that movie, I can't tell you how many times I watched it. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and the thing about these movies is, these movies kind of gave me my love for horror. And these movies are what got me to seek out and enjoy stuff like Near Dark and The Thing and, you know, all these other really, really good movies that I eventually got into. But these are the ones, this is where it started, you know. I think <clears throat> that almost, I mean, with almost anything, I think movies is mainstream movies and independent films, I guess you have, you have like auteurs, people that are like, ooh, you know, if you like Forrest Gump, then you'll like this weird French impressionistic 
long shot of a clown for four hours. Like, you know, people have their opinions of indies, Mm -hmm. you know, indie music is usually pretty good. Depends not, you know, just because you happen to make music doesn't mean that you're a good musician. Right. Same thing with movies or whatever. But I think that you're kind of like your B and C movies, like the ones you described. I think that opens up such a wide worldview of what's acceptable or not acceptable, but what's possible. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, this is, you know, something that I could do. I could write a story like this and we, you know, we can make this, it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it doesn't take much to put a, put a hand in a basket. Right. You know, of course you do have your final appearance of the, of, of the shark and stuff that you have to really pay attention to, but the, you can make 90% of that movie with, you know, you. Right. And I think the, that's what draws horror too, is because it's like, how did they make that? How did they do that? How did they explode that head? You know? Right. Um, so I, I love it too. But I mean, as a, as a nine, 10, 11 year old kid, I didn't need, you know, Oscar worthy movies. No, of course. Shit that was fun. I wasn't worried about the acting. I wasn't worried about <laughs> you know, the special effects. As long as they were cool, they didn't have to Like, dude, loving, loving Jaws 3 and then growing up and watching it again, being like, wah, wah, wah. you know, but doesn't take away the fact that I sat there like almost daily right. and just watched that over and over and over again. And if you weren't paying attention when I asked the question or when uh, Art Albert on the forum was like, Name a name a uh, actor and we'll guess the movie. Yeah. Leah Thompson was in Jaws three. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! It wasn't Howard the Duck, which was <laughs> was frightening but wasn't scary. <laughs> but, the, but at the same time, Howard the Duck is another movie. When that movie came, you know, we revisit movies now and we can see the problems that you know they actually had. But when I was a kid watching Howard the Duck, that was a good ass movie. <laughs> I wanted to see it again. There was just an awesome. Yeah, a talking duck. <laughs> you know, it was it was awesome. Looking at it now through a different you know lens, I still give it all the credit in the world because it's a, it's a nostalgia wise, it's a great movie, but it it can be redone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and like I said, these are the movies that brought me finally where you know Friday the Thirteen Four Three one of my favorite ones. Mm-hmm. But these are the movies that kind of started it all. Yeah. Same same with my list. You know, not high not high art, but a lot of fun. Strangely enough, it was a lot of me you know, watching them by myself because my cousins were like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, hey, man, thanks, everybody, for posting the questions and asking the questions and such. And um, we'd like to do a pro- once every six or eight weeks, maybe do a ask us anything or ask us questions yeah. and and stuff. We will be continuing like we we were we normally record two two episodes. This is a little housekeeping at the end of the show. If you want to skip on by this and we'll see you next week, but we normally record two episodes, but we got the Houston horror film festival coming up next week that uh, this weekend, actually that we're going to be at. So next week's show is going to be kind of a recap. Um, I'm going to bring my microphone to that show and try to talk to a couple folks and just get some man on the street interviews with some vendors and some uh, celebrities um, as I get a chance to through the day. So that'll be next week, and then the following week we're going to talk about getting Boom back on and then start getting our interviews lined up. And so far, as things look, looks like we're booked pretty solid into the next several weeks. So yeah. if you're interested in being on the show, reach out. Um, if you're interested in being on the show, do us a favor too. Like join the forum and get get in and start getting to know people so that whenever we – publish people know who you are and you yeah. know, kind of have a relationship with them too not that that's been a problem for anybody before but um as we grow um join the join the conversation and and, and have some fun and with that that's been episode 166 and uh keep it scary later